Church, I just want to say good morning to everyone here, and it's always such a good time just to be in the house of God. Is anyone here excited to be here this morning? You see, the Lord is so wonderful, and even actually, I was just reminded what Brian was saying, that the world out there is so interesting that just what's happening, it's not even elections. I was actually on a train this week and heading to Seattle for work, and this was so strange, but I saw a man that was holding a bike, and he wanted to have a seat that was on, on the train, and just so he could either prop it up or sit and hold the bike. There was an older lady that was sitting there, much older than him, and Believe it or not, he started to yell at her, and I was surprised. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell who he was because he had a mask on, but uh, what's amazing is the fact that there's a few other women that were sitting nearby. They started yelling back at him, and I was like, he obviously has no chance, <laughs> but what happened was, I guess why I'm saying this story is the fact that there's so many things that go on in this world, and I, wasn't so, I was really surprised to see that at 6.30 in the morning. I was thinking, who has the energy to yell so much in the morning? But the fact that, I mean, he got off in Auburn, and praise God, he got off. There wasn't any, any violence on the train, but I was, it just came to my thought. I was like, people need help. This world needs Jesus, and we just need to reach them with the gospel that actually can save them. As a matter of fact, what he was experiencing, it's not even about the yelling that he was doing. It's more deeper, something more spiritual that goes on in people's lives. And maybe some of you here have experienced spiritual encounters or things that maybe felt like almost took possession of you or really control. And you're like, I can't believe I just yelled or I can't believe I just did something. But you see, what it really proves is that we all need help. We all need Jesus Christ that sets the captives free. And this is why I'm excited, excited about continuing the book of Acts chapter 19. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to continue from chapter 19, starting from verse 11. You could turn with me just to verse 11 and 12, and while you're turning there, just wanted to give you a quick background. As far as this is Apostle Paul was ministering to, to the church of Ephesus, and this was his third time, his third missionary journey, and he spent three years there in Ephesus and just teaching in the synagogue and the school of Tyrannus. And he was telling them about Jesus Christ, telling them that you need to really understand who Jesus is. Because the first time he came, the year before, he spent three months there and they only heard about John's baptism. And so it was about time that they needed to hear about the teaching of Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross and setting the captives free. Before, let, let's, let's read those verses and I'll share a quick story. So verse 11 and 12, it says, and God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. So Paul is walking in the authority of the Holy Spirit and he's seeing an amazing power of God. And just like as Pastor Dan was preaching last Sunday, and he was mentioning the fact that, you know, Paul was ministering to the people of, of Ephesus in the fact that the turnout of his persistence and strategic location really brought change in a region that was so drastically changed by the power of God, by the Spirit of God. Let me share a quick story. I was, in a, I was in a team meeting at work, and I came into the office, and it was wonderful. They, um, we had a little separate session in the afternoon during the, after lunchtime, and so they served us some really good ice cream. Some, it was really creamy, really good brand, and I just absolutely enjoyed it. Anyone like ice cream here? All right. As I was eating the ice cream, they had a little game set up for us just to really get to know the other coworkers and managers and so forth. And they called it like speed dating, which obviously you, it was a different form at work. It was just really meant to get to know other people who your coworkers are, and really, they had a list of about five questions for us. And so we would ask these questions as we kind of rotate out person to person. So one of the questions really stood out to me, and the question was, if you had one superpower, what would it be? Some of you are starting to think, and it sounds like you like that question. 
So what came to my mind, I was thinking, well, I, I understand we're at work, and I'm, I'm like, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And thinking, how can I at least maybe either share Christ through my answer, or how can I at least give them a hint that they need more, or there's something better out there, and that's Jesus, and they could, we can have a follow-up conversation. So I prepared my answer as we were kind of going down the line, and so my answer to them was, I said, I... I would love to have the healing power to empty all the hospitals. And so all the, this is like, this puts all the doctors and nurses out of work. (laughs) But, you know, I was thinking, how can that give them a hint, the fact that it's still a good thing, right, to do in the world, and it would bring a lot of change, because there's a lot of sick people out there. But at the same time, what if they continue to ask me about, well, that's great, and I could lead them to a discussion about Jesus because he gives us the power to heal the sick and raise the dead in Jesus' name. So as we continue to go on these questions, and all of a sudden, we're done with the list of questions, and I wanted to tell you the conclusion that I was able to draw. Three out of 12 people, I was completely shocked by their answer to this question. Three out of 12 said that they wanted to be either a witch or Harry Potter. And I'm talking, these are people in management, these are people, VPs and so forth. So it, these, are, these are not, I mean, these are, everyone's a person, everyone actually tells them, you know, tells others about their desires and what, they could joke about it. They could like, oh, I'd love to control things, I'd love to, you know, have special power. People could take it as a joke, but they really respond what's inside their heart. So I came to a conclusion was the fact that people are spiritually hungry in the natural world. But what they really need is the Holy Spirit, but they settle for darkness. So if I was to message this, uh, name this sermon this morning, I would call it the supernatural power in a natural world. You see, every one of us has supernatural. We can walk in the supernatural, but every single person can walk either in darkness or in light. You see, there are four idols that have a hypnotic attraction. First is money. It's the accumulation of resources and getting wealthy. The second thing is fame. It's getting an admiration and getting respect from others. The third is pleasure. It's just the constant feeling, uh, feeling good and vacations and so forth. And also the fourth is power. It's the fourth idol. And really it's where someone likes the control or is just a commanding position. Now, Is it a good thing or a bad thing? It could be used in a good or the bad. So it could be used in a good way where you can have great leadership. You can have a great nation. You could bring very good change to society and culture and have very good law and order established. But it could also have the negative aspect where it could bring dictatorship. It could bring communism. It could bring social injustice, abuse in families and toxic workplaces and even witchcraft. You see, some of the examples that we can think of, even in the presidency, it's very, who thinks it's important to have the right president in place? You see, because leadership has influence and they have the power, now how they use that will impact those that they rule over. So that's why it's so important to vote for the right person, for the right governors, for the judges, the school principals, having the right business owners in place, and Lord, bless more and more people to be established in those places of authority to give glory unto the Father. We need more of that, and the Lord bless you and expand your knowledge and position you and bless you financially to take those positions and remove all the evil strongholds in this world. You see, there's three things I want to focus on this morning based on these verses we'll continue reading. is that God has given you a power as a believer. There is a God-given power. The second thing is that this power that he gives you is through the Holy Spirit and that he doesn't just transform your life. He transforms people around you and through you, not just to enjoy but work through you. And the third thing is that we as human beings, we encounter spiritual warfare all the time. The Bible says that it's not nor flesh nor blood that we come against. It's the evil rulers, authorities, and principalities. And so we'll talk talk about that as well. So for the first one is the God-given power. So let's take a look at verse 13 through 16. 
a group of Jews was traveling from town to town casting out evil spirits. And they tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time they, when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. I don't, I don't think I want to imagine how it ended because <laughs> they came with clothing left without, and apparently they thought they were strong, and the fact that they thought they could come against someone and use the name of Jesus in the wrong way. If you think about who these people are, they went from city to city with a good intention to cast out demons. But if you think about what they were doing, and by the way, this is not the God-given power. It's not about the ministerial legacy. It's not about being a pastor's kid that qualifies you for God's power. It's not the quantity of people. There were seven of them trying to cast out one man, the demon out of one man. And it's not incantation, or in other words, saying specific magical words or phrases, or they even tried to use the name of Jesus, and apparently it worked. <laughs> it triggered the demon in the person. But you see, they weren't successful even casting out that demon. He knew Jesus. He knew Paul, but not them. So it's not even in the special words that we could try to use. And you see, they tried to imitate the power that Paul had because he had the miraculous signs that were happening through him. But you can't imitate the power of God. Don't try to copy and paste what you see others doing. What you really need is not imitation, but the real invitation from the Holy Spirit and actually work in, in parallel and work with them to see the power of God move in your life. You see, these seven sons of Sceva, maybe they were trying to gain more followers. They were maybe looking for fame. They had the right authority. They were sons of the leading priest and so forth. And they thought, well, let's get another 10,000 followers just for casting out this demon. Well, apparently they ran across the wrong one. And I think they just lost 10,000 instead of gaining 10,000 followers. You see, well, what does it mean to actually have the power of God? And some of you think, well, maybe that's just for Paul or just for Peter. But let me tell you this. It's nothing special that we oftentimes have an illusion thinking, well, I need to be someone so powerful and have, a, have the apostle anointing or one of these men of God that we read about. It's not even that. What it's really about is having the Holy Spirit presence in your life. It's as simple as that. It's not trying to control. It's instead being equipped by the Holy Spirit and yield to him. And instead of looking for seven and backup people to help you cast out a demon, you can do it by yourself. And it's not about you. It's about the one person of the Holy Spirit in you that will cast out that demon in Jesus' name. You see, when we yield to the Holy Spirit, not try to control, but we yield to the Holy Spirit and let him do what he wants to do. He performs the power. He's the one that does the miracle. He's the one that brings the, those lost and brings salvation. He is the one that, that brings the miraculous through your life. And you see, at the end of the day, it wasn't there to bring fame to the person, but bring fame to the one and only Jesus Christ. You see, when God uses you, it's there not to bring glory to you. It's there to bring glory to God. Now, if you abuse that and you think you're successful for some time, you will get destroyed, as we saw in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But you see, at the end of the day, if we instead take the position of saying, Holy Spirit, do whatever you want to do, we want to be a powerful witness in this time that we live in because it's so dark and demonic and we want to see your power move and set the captives free in Jesus' name. I was sitting at a church camp one summer, summer night and it was a little bit cooler and there was a nice bonfire that they that they got ready and the fire was just crackling and it was just so wonderful just to kind of get warm. Is maybe about 10 years ago when I was at a youth camp. And they, of course, they had the guitar and they were singing worship and just, just enjoying the presence of Jesus and getting to know each other, getting to know other youth members. And, and I was sitting there and uh, we were blessed to have a, a woman of God and she was known as a prophet in our church and she spoke accurately according to the word of God. And and I, I was sitting, I was thinking, we have an amazing person. And I don't know about you, by the way, but I, sometimes I was always curious. 
I didn't want to put it this way, but it's almost, almost as if you're asking, hey, can you tell me more about your superpower? Obviously, it's not a superpower. It's just a gifting from the Lord. So I didn't always feel comfortable asking, hey, like, how does God use you? Like, I was genuinely curious, not try to have something for my own gain. So I decided to have a little bit of boldness, and I asked this woman, I said, hey, God has used you as a prophet. How does he speak to you? So she was excited to answer, and she said, hey, this is what the Lord, he comes and he speaks to me, and it's different for every person, she said, but he gives you a word, and you know it's from him, and you release it by faith. And again, it could be different for every person, but the fact that what it taught me was, was that we need to be open to the spiritual gifts. That's one. And if we're not curious in the right way, we will go search out the dark world instead. You have a gifting because the Holy Spirit is inside of you as a born-again believer. So what that means is that if you have a gifting from the Lord... There was something called the school of prophets. In other words, you also can be guided and trained by a prophet because they needed to be guided in the right way. So in other words, this also works with other giftings. It's okay to ask a pastor, evangelist, different, different giftings or other people that are serving. Ask them, hey, can you guide me in a way and let them pour out their hearts and pour out the knowledge because if you won't get that, you'll search for the power somewhere, somewhere else. So as I was, really, I was really thankful for that. You see, 40 to 50% of Americans believe in the supernatural. And that's on the conservative side. It's a little bit higher with many reporting belief in ghosts, demons, and other paranormal phenomena. With a significant portion claiming to have experienced a paranormal event themselves. Maybe you're sitting here and... You also believe in the supernatural. Now, honestly, I hope you do believe because the most supernatural person is the Holy Spirit. And some people maybe don't believe in this world, but can I tell you, out of this statistic, did you realize that it includes both the believer and the non-believer? The fact that even non-believers believe in the supernatural says that each person can tap, can tap into the light or the dark. My question is, where are we tapping into what are we looking for? And again, we're not, I'm not talking about idolizing the power. I'm talking about walking in the power for the glory of God. Where are we searching? And some of you might be thinking, well, I don't always feel comfortable talking about this subject. I'm okay seeing the physical side of things only. And I don't like to talk about ghosts and demons. And, you know, can I tell you, today's your day. We're going to expose this topic, because it's normal for us to walk and hear about what the Holy Spirit does is that demonic attacks are real, that spiritual warfare is real, and when we are properly equipped, we can win. We can walk in victory. You'll see breakthrough in your life. So with that, then you might think, well, am I equipped, am I qualified to have God's power? The very simple answer is yes. The Bible says that for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. With you, when you are in the body of Christ, you are equipped. The fullness of the Holy Spirit means that you have access to every gifting. Wherever God has placed you, it's a matter of are you willing to yield? Are you willing to submit for him to do that work in you and through you in Jesus' name? Number two, the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. So verse 17 through 20, let's read it together. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to the Jews and Greeks alike, and a solemn fear descended on a city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at the public bonfire. That is an awesome bonfire. <laughs> A big one. And the value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. Listen, the Bible doesn't talk about that that person was delivered. But what it does talk about was what the demon said. Do you realize what the demon said that I know Jesus? I know Paul. 
but who are you? Did you realize it almost scared them to realize that apparently the Jesus that Paul taught for three years is more powerful than all the books we've had. And the demon is scared of those people, Jesus and Paul, and Paul preaches Jesus. And so what happened with this was that this experience led to a public confession and a public transformation. You see, this is what the Holy Spirit does in regions, in cities, and even in the nations. Do you realize that the magic books, these things that they relied on so much, I did the calculation on this. If you look at all the numbers and all the value of the books that they brought forward, can you believe it here, just for your own understanding, let's say if you make $200 per day, maybe $300, maybe more or less, just to give you an example. If you look at it from that perspective, today's currency, today's value, and you compare it to the 50,000 pieces of silver that it was talking about, it's 10 to $15 million. Do you realize what kind of bonfire that they were burning? It's like bringing a briefcase and saying, here it is. But that can only happen when the power of God does a work in the region. This can only happen and people surrender these things because they've realized they've encountered something more powerful. And his name is the Holy Spirit. And Paul has been trying to teach them and tell them the fact that there is someone greater, there is someone stronger. And his persistence of the three months the first time, coming next year for another three years to teach them about Jesus Christ. And the fact that Ephesus was a great city and strategically located as a hub of commerce and transportation. You see, his persistence and his strategic positioning led to a supernatural occurrence that just spread all over. You see, years later, he wrote to the church of Ephesus, about five to nine years later. What does that mean? That the fruit of his labor was worth it. Was that he was first thinking, how is God going to do something here? Through one occurrence. And through persistent teaching of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you see the confession of many. They walked out in their confession and, and, and walked out their repentance by burning the books. Imagine the persistence of us preaching the gospel. Imagine the persistence of public transformation in this region. And imagine the restoration for this area that we live in. Some people call this place hopeless or the Northwest is too hard. But I'm believing for Parkland, I'm believing for Seattle, I'm believing for the Northwest and for this nation. There is still hope. And the only hope that we can really see that they can receive is Jesus Christ himself. Hudson Taylor, famous missionary to China, in late 1800 said, many Christians estimate difficulties in the light of their own resources and thus attempt little and often fail in the little they attempt. All God's giants have been weak, men who did great things for God because they reckoned on his power and presence with him. You see, some of you think that, well, I'm weak. What can I do in this society? What can I do in this city? There's many people who thought that, but this really pushes us to rely on God, rely on the Holy Spirit work. You see, we should be very thankful for the, for, tr for the Holy Spirit transforming our lives, but let Him continue that transformation in the place that we live in. You see, some of you, my question to you, where has God strategically positioned you in an area of influence to come with the powerful effect of the Holy Spirit? You see, you carry the fullness of the Holy Spirit as a born-again believer. Will you yield to the Holy Spirit wherever you go? You see, teachers, stay persistent in teaching the right curriculum. Don't bend to the social, social trends and the things that they're trying to push. You see, because these kids look up to you, and some say they want to be like you. Those in the family, you think, how can I be a better light? Maybe some of you have children that are not in the Lord. And maybe you're attempting to do your best to show Jesus and trying to teach them and tell them. Maybe they're not always listening. Listen, Jesus didn't call you to be perfect, but can you at least give them a little glimpse of Jesus who is the one that's perfect? 
by praying for them, being an example for them. Maybe those who are business owners, you feel pressured to to bend to the social trends also and maybe to do what other people are doing just to gain more clientele. Listen, stand on the truth of God's word and God will bless you and overflow. And when you are upholding the truth and found on that truth, in Jesus' name. The third thing is that we come in a spiritual warfare every single day. You see, the book of Ephesians says that it's not flesh nor blood that we come against. It's not the things that we see with our physical eyes. Sometimes we maybe encounter different things and you might want to look at your spouse or look at the child and say, yeah, that, that's your fault for arguing. That's your fault for yelling. But if we take a step back and really think about like, what's happening in the atmosphere, There's something greater that's happening, and the devil's trying to destroy families, trying to destroy spiritual, the spiritual state in your life, and tries to distract you from the glory of God and tries to distract you from what God is trying to do. And we sometimes blame each other for the things we encounter, and we fight each other instead of fighting the devil, instead of relying on the Holy Spirit for for him to help us overcome that challenge, overcome that situation. You see, if we took a look at Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, let's read it together. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in the mighty power. Put on all God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. Verse 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits and the heavenly places. You see, Paul talks about in this chapter 6, first he talks about the family relationship about between parents and children, that there's a specific order and authority. Then he gets into the authority order of masters and slaves and of the ownership that they had at the time. And then he talks about the third, which is about the spiritual warfare which about in, in, uh, in the authority of the spiritual. And so that's why he says in chapter 6 about putting the whole armor of God upon our life. It's to rely on God against these spiritual battles that we encounter. Billy Sunday, an old-time evangelist, said, he must have gone to church every Sunday. <laughs> he said, I'm against sin. I'll kick it as long as I've got a foot. I'll fight it as long as I've got a fist. I'll butt it as long as I have a head. And I'll bite it as long as I've got a tooth. And when I'm old, fistless, footless, and toothless, I'll gum it till I go home to glory. I know some of you really like that one. (laughs) Because you can keep fighting, and as a matter of fact, that fight continues every day. My friend, listen very carefully. You can encounter such drastic change in your life. And you could blame the traffic on your way to work. You could fight your family members' parents just for all the years and history that you've been having. You can blame, you could blame many different things and say, oh, the Lord's not blessing you. I've always been poor. But what if we stopped to recognize What if there's something in the spirit that we need to come against? You see, we put on the whole armor of God. That means we are always positioned to fight. We are always positioned in a spiritual warfare. Ephesians, so a few verses later, actually said, to pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all the believers everywhere. God has called us to be alert. You know that I started this message with some of you might not like talking about the spiritual and supernatural and so forth. But if we're not alert, the devil takes advantage of this. He comes against you and you think, well, it must be something in the natural, not in the supernatural. But imagine when you are equipped and understanding what battle am I facing? Can I recognize what's actually happening in the spirit, then you know how to fight. One time we were doing local missions here in this area, and uh, it was just a wonderful time. Instead of going out of state, 
instead of going out of the country, we did it here locally in the federal area. We partnered with a few churches And it was just a wonderful time seeing the gospel being preached and seeing people come to Christ. It was actually one of my more first experiences of seeing demons cast out as well. And it's really awesome to see that, to learn that, and see the power of God move. We had a few friends that came from Portland, Oregon, that came up and came to partner with us and help us. So at the time, this was about 10 years ago, I wasn't married yet. And these friends, they stayed with us at my parents' house. And um, we were ministering for about three, four days. And so they were helping us. And my parents were gracious to have them over and to stay the night. So after seeing just an amazing time after day one and after day two, on the third, so going into day three, we're about to go minister again. You kind of, you're in that mode and just come on, let's go cast out some demons. Let's go preach the gospel. It's just exciting. We went to sleep that second night, and again, we're in the same home. At 4 a.m., I, I saw a dream, and all of a sudden, I see in front of my parents' driveway, there's no cars that were parked. I was, That's fine, and then, interesting, and I saw an older woman was walking up the driveway closer to our home. I was like, that's really strange. Who's this? Is this a pizza delivery? <laughs> Is this someone trying to share the gospel with us? I mean, we don't need it. We're doing that ourselves. <laughs> and it was strange because she was carrying a small rug in her arm. I was like, that's really strange. <laughs> and so as she was coming closer, she started to lay out this little rug right on the middle of the driveway. And I was like, this is about to be a Muslim prayer right now. We don't need that. <laughs> we don't need that. This home is blessed. <laughs> and so I didn't do anything because obviously it's in a dream. And I'm just watching. And then all of a sudden I see empty cups, empty jars. And I was like, okay, this is not good. This is witchcraft. She laid out that rug in front of the home and a bunch of different things she brought with her and was going to cast spells at our home. Again, this is all in a dream, by the way. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> and so I wake up, and I was like, this is a real dream. You guys have real dreams like this sometimes? Maybe not like this, but when you know it's real, it's real. Anyone here? And then you start to think. You start to pray. What do I do? Is this from the Lord? Is this maybe I ate too much pizza the night before or too many video games or movies? But when it's not any of those things, you know, there's no factors that can skew this moment. So you know God was trying to speak to you something. So then I start to pray in the Spirit, praying in tongues and praying in the Spirit, pleading the blood of Jesus over our home, protection. After praying about 10 minutes, I just felt peace come over me. I just went back to sleep. I didn't even check through the window if that was actually true because the guests were sleeping there. So I didn't want to go in and just like, hey, can I check? Definitely was not going to step outside. (laughs) It's because I had the peace of God in my heart. So in the morning, I wake up, and obviously I remember the dream. You know, there's dreams you forget, but there's definitely ones you don't. And I tell the guys that woke up, and we had some tea and some breakfast, and I was like, hey, I want to share something with you guys. I saw this dream, and I went into details the way I just described to you. And I said, This is really strange, and it happened at 4 a.m. They said, German, you won't believe this. I woke up at 4 a.m. as well. And I started, I woke up, and I stretched my hand towards the driveway because they were in the room, right in front of the driveway. And I was praying that direction in tongues, and I prayed for a little bit and went back to sleep. This doesn't end right there. We went to the church where we gathered all together as a group. And we're ready for day three of ministry. And I share with a few others because we're already inspired. It's like, wow, look what God can do. And then we tell a few more. At least one or two more people said, you won't believe I also woke up around 4 a.m. And I started to pray in the spirit. I felt something was off. Later that morning, we found out that apparently someone that was part of the group was actually being very divisive and was kind of going against one of the leaders and God was protecting us as a group 
So we excommunicated him. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, we prayed for him instead, obviously. Do you realize that the spiritual world is more real than you know? We're not just talking about it just to give you an interesting story. We're not just talking about the supernatural and just we only talk about the Holy Spirit. No, we talk about the demons. We talk about the witchcraft, the things that are in this world because the music industry is getting infiltrated. The Hollywood is trying to go demonic. This is real stuff. And if we're not equipped, how can we walk out this life? What encounters have you been facing in your life? Do you realize that your life is a mission field? Do you realize you're on a mission if you didn't know? How do I know? Because every born again believer has a mission to fulfill. And if you're on a mission, what is God trying to do? Are you recognizing the things in your life, whether maybe you've encountered some difficulties and spiritual attacks, or maybe God is trying to use you somewhere are you seeing the supernatural world through the eyes of the Holy Spirit and not just the natural world? You see, Job saw a drastic change in his life. He lost so much, everything at once. Paul, we read in chapter 16, there's a slave girl that was following them. She was fortune telling the future. He got annoyed and he cast out the demon out of her and those people got mad at him. But you see, the spiritual world is real in Judas. Also, the betrayer, he allowed the devil to enter him, and Jesus was perfectly aware of that. Jesus recognized that. You see, this list is not limited, but I want you to keep in mind. There are different forms of spiritual attacks, and I, I want you to listen very carefully. You see, sometimes being overcome by physical fatigue, feelings of discouragement, depression, defeat, overcome by anxiety, spiritual desire, loss, and dryness, experiencing many stressful situations back to back, doubting God's goodness, temptation, troublesome and disturbing and negative thought life. What about fear? What about thoughts about, what about, thoughts about going back to your old lifestyle? Despair. Old emotional wounds surfacing from the past. Accepting lies as truth. Overwhelmed by feelings of shame, guilt, and condemnation. Battling thoughts of revenge. Heightened feelings of rejection and loneliness and struggle with belonging. Confusion over what to believe. Maybe a lack attack. It's so in other words, what Job faced. Maybe a spirit of heaviness, strife, and arguments in your relationships all the time. Severe, intense troubles. Maybe you start to abuse something to numb your pain. You see, we're not going to limit to this list, but some of these things are actually for us to recognize. Do I need to pray? into something right now because that's not normal. I know we could go on with our day because we're always busy and we can continue stumbling over the same thing over and over and we thought, why isn't the Christian life blessed? <laughs> you see, when we become more aware of what God is trying to do and open our spiritual eyes, you will start to walk in victory and be more effective in what God is doing. All right, here it is. So the three things to take away this morning. You see, I love the encouragement, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. You see, God has given you the authority, and that's through the Holy Spirit. That's all you need. You just need the Holy Spirit in your life, and he does the work in you. Number two is the transformative power of the Holy Spirit. We read in the beginning of Acts, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And the third, it's not flesh nor blood. You see the spiritual warfare. I love what Jesus said. It said, Luke 10, 19. It said, look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. And nothing will injure you. 
But don't rejoice because of the evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. You see, we not only rejoice in our salvation, but we walk out this life with power and authority because of the Holy Spirit. Listen, don't over-spiritualize everything. Please understand me. Don't be walking around and try to cast out demons from those wearing scary Halloween costumes or something. (laughs) I'm not saying everything is demonic, but be very aware that there are many things that are more spiritual than you think. You see, when we're sensitive, this is why it's so important to talk to the Holy Spirit every day. Even if you question something, just ask, Holy Spirit, what is this? If you sense an atmosphere shift, Holy Spirit, what are you trying to do? It's really being sensitive to Him and see His power at work.